How did the U.S. manned space program evolve from the X-15 to the space shuttle? Let's find out in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat by request. From the very beginning of the X-15 program to the first shuttle flights was approximately 20 years. And in that span of time, these odd looking airplanes flew. They were called the lifting bodies. The lifting body concept, who put this in there? Who are these guys? <sighs> lifting bodies proved the principle of a manned spacecraft re-entering the Earth's atmosphere from orbit and gliding to a landing at a predetermined location like a conventional aircraft. They flew from 1963 to 1975. These vehicles generated aerodynamic lift by their shape alone adding only small vertical fins for stability. These shapes were first tested and proven with radio controlled flying models and then in extensive wind tunnel testing. But before we talk about lifting bodies, let's look at the history of rocket powered manned flight. The first manned rocket powered airplane was the German Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet used in combat during World War II. It took off under its own power, uh, flew a ballistic trajectory to intercept targets, and then when the fuel was expended, it glided to a landing like a glider. It was that same profile used by the famed X-planes at Edwards in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The Bell X-1, the X-1A, the X-2, the Douglas Skyrocket, and considered the most successful research aircraft uh, flown of that generation, the North American X-15. The X-15 was launched from a B-52 mothership, rocketed into space, and then returned to Edwards Air Force Base and landed on Rogers Dry Lake. 199 flights were made. By comparison, the orbital manned space program at that time involved the Mercury capsule. Here we see John Glenn boarding Friendship 7 for his historic flight on February 20th, 1962. Launched atop an Atlas rocket, uh, he uh, went for three orbits and then returned uh, by parachute landing in the ocean. So the term touchdown for a landing was replaced by the term splashdown. The astronauts were retrieved, as was the capsules, by a, a Navy helicopter, or Marine helicopter in this case, uh, returning to an uh, aircraft carrier. Same with the Gemini program and, of course, the Apollo program. The range uh, of, of control during these uh, uh, re-entries into the ocean was approximately 40 miles, and some uh, covered that distance while others landed within sight of the carrier. The issue here, though, is that once they landed, uh, these spacecraft were only used one time, and they were relegated to being displayed in museums. They were never flown again. In 1962, there was also another concept, the Boeing X-20, uh, which involved an Air Force crew and a two-man uh, spacecraft that could glide into a landing. Uh, it was never flown, however. It was canceled before it was ever built. But I have to tell you, uh, this involved the use of dynamic soaring, and this created one of, in my opinion, one of the coolest names ever applied to anything that ever flew. If you take dynamic soaring and contract it, you wind up with the dinosaur. Pretty cool. Out in California at the NASA Dryden Flight Research Center, located at Edwards Air Force Base, the M2F1 took shape. On the left is uh, NASA Program Director Paul Bickle, and he's congratulating NASA pilot Joe Walker on his X-15 flight to 354,000 feet, an altitude record, the highest flight of the X-15 program. Ironically, Bickle himself set an altitude record two years earlier flying this sailplane to more than 46,000 feet in the Sierra wave. In 1963, Bickle spearheaded an in-house campaign to design and build the F2, M2F1, M for manned and F for flight. Enlisting the support of his team's EAA members and California sailplane builder Gus Breedlieb, a plywood and steel tube flying bathtub seen here was built for a cost of $30,000 just unheard of for a research aircraft. It was a pretty bare bones machine. 
Here's the instrument panel containing uh, basically altitude and speed and instrumentation for a small rocket engine that was added later in the program uh, to boost the uh, uh, glide path for landing. The M2F1 was initially auto-towed from Rogers Dry Lake by this modified Pontiac Catalina convertible fitted with a 421 cubic inch tri-power V8 engine custom built by Speed King Mickey Thompson's shop. With a four barrel carburetor and four speed, the car accelerated from zero to 110 miles an hour in 30 seconds. In the name of research, it got four miles per gallon. Aero tows were then made with a Douglas C47 using a 1,000 foot tow line. By comparison, a normal sailplane is towed with a 200 foot tow line. Based on the success of this proof of concept aircraft, NASA was very impressed with the performance of the M2 F1. It was flown by NASA pilots and Air Force pilots. A number of uh, interesting folks checked out in the airplane, as we'll see in a few moments. And let's look at the uh, history of the M2 F1. It made more than 100 auto tows off the lake bed, 77 aero tows. It operated at speeds between 80 and 90 miles per hour. And the max altitude at launch, of course, was 10,000 feet. Uh, this vehicle is now displayed at the Air Force Flight Test Center Museum at Edwards Air Force Base. Again, based on the proof of concept success, NASA issued a request for proposal for what were called the heavyweight lifting bodies using several different shapes. Five manufacturers bid on the program and Northrop was awarded a contract for two vehicles, the M2F2 shown here and the HL10, which we'll see in a moment. Cost for these unique experimental aircraft was only $1.2 million a piece. Here we see the shape of the M2F2, basically a cone cut in half and the uh, curved surface on the bottom uh, creates the lift with the vertical fins for lateral stability. Here's the side view of the M2F2, a unique looking airplane. Flights were launched from the same B-52 mothership used by the X-15, but they had to have a special adapter fitted to the pylon. Launch altitudes ranged from 40 to 45,000 feet and flights lasted only four minutes until landing on the lake bed. On May 10th, 1967, a famous accident that was depicted in the opening sequence of the TV show, Six Million Dollar Man, occurred at Edwards. The pilot was NASA's Bruce Peterson. He had experienced control difficulties and aerodynamic problems at the very beginning of the flight and had a much higher, much steeper rate of descent than normal. Upon approaching the lake bed, he uh, extended the landing gear, but it did not lock in place. And as he touched down, the gear collapsed and caused a, uh, a series of uh, rolls across the lake bed at 250 miles per hour. Miraculously, Peterson survived, although he lost the sight of one eye. So overall, the M2 program was very successful. It was rebuilt as the M2 F3 after the accident. And that's seen here in the picture with the uh, added third vertical fin there in the center. That aircraft flew in 1970, the original flew in 1966. A total of 16 flights for the F2, 27 flights for the F3. It achieved a top speed of Mach 1.61 and a maximum altitude of 71,500 feet. The F3 is currently displayed at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum on the Mall in Washington, DC. The next lifting body was the Northrop HL-10, a very different shape. It was essentially the opposite of the uh, M2 with a flat bottom and a curved top. Here we see it on the adapter to the pylon on the uh, B-52 mothership. Very aesthetically pleasing aircraft. And this is a painting by my fellow NASA documentary art program artist, Stan Stokes. In my opinion, one of the best uh, X-plane paintings ever done, really captures the feeling of the desert and descending toward the lake bed, just a stunning piece of artwork. So here's the HL-10 turning final. If you were in a light airplane, you'd be in this position, you'd be turning final for Bakersfield, which is about 60 miles away. But believe it or not, this airplane is gonna land on the lake bed runway 18 seen below. 
You'll notice there are three segments to runway 18. On the right is reserved for the X-15. And you can see the uh, marks from the skids on the runway there on the right. On the left, it says LB only, lifting bodies only. And that was the runway uh, devoted to the lifting bodies. The center runways for all the, was for all the other uh, test aircraft at Edwards. But believe it or not, this airplane is going to land right there. That's what a 10,000 foot rate of descent looks like. The landing gear was uh, controlled with a, a pneumatic shot. It extended, uh, was not able to be retracted after it extended, but it was uh, saved until the very last few seconds. Uh, the deployment took all of 1.8 seconds uh, to extend the gear, uh, but it was uh, just at the very last moment to keep the aerodynamic integrity of the lifting body. And here we see the HL-10 rolling out on the lake bed. I took this photo of the HL-10 in building 1600 at Edwards during an open house in 1974. The HL-10 first flew in 1966, total of 37 flights. It reached a speed of Mach 1.8 and an altitude of 90,303 feet, the highest and fastest of the lifting bodies. This machine is displayed at the uh, parking lot, actually, of the Dryden Flight Research Center, now the Armstrong Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base. Last of the three lifting bodies was the Martin X-24. This was an Air Force program, so it received an official X designation. Here we see the X-24A, and this was modified into the X-24B with a long nose and a glove around the original uh, fuselage. This was a very successful aircraft. Now, in the upper left of this photo, you see a, a spot there. That's not a mark on the photo. That is the Bell UH-1N rescue helicopter with the flight surgeon and support crew that was always uh, at the ready should there be uh, an emergency on the lake bed with the lifting body. Here we see a nice shot, early morning shot of the X-24B mounted on the uh, NB-52 mothership. And this is the business end. I should have mentioned that the lifting bodies were powered by uh, rocket engines uh, to, for their initial uh, flight uh, profile before uh, coming down for a landing. And this is the uh, XLR-11 rocket engine, which is the same power plant used in the original Bell X-1. Now, this is not a Photoshopped image. This is an actual photo taken from uh, the backseat of a two-seat F-104. And this is the angle of descent heading for the lake bed. Here we see the X-24B turning final again for lake bed 1-8, settling in for the landing. And on September 9th, 1975, NASA pilot Bill Dana made the last powered flight of the X-24B and the last flight of a rocket powered airplane at Edwards Air Force Base. Ironically, Bill Dana made the last flight of the X-15 program as well on October 24th, 1968, the 199th flight of the program. Now, if you've heard of the back of the napkin sketch, this is it, this is the actual napkin. And what I'm showing here was the flight of August 5th, 1975, when John Mankey flew the X-24B to the first landing of a rocket powered aircraft on a concrete runway, touching down with a spot landing 5,000 feet from the threshold of Edwards runway 22. This was a concept sketch for what was going to be a painting for the NASA documentary art program. Uh, it did not come to pass, but I saved the sketch, and it's really uh, a neat experience to be able to share this with you in this program. The title was Putting It All on the Line. That landing validated the concept of a re-entering spacecraft, making precision landings on a runway, as the space shuttle did numerous times at both Edwards and the Kennedy Space Center. The Northrop X-24A, first flown in 1967, made 28 flights, achieved a speed of Mach 1.6 and 71,400 feet altitude. The X-24B uh, made 36 total flights, uh, achieved a speed of Mach 1.75 and an altitude of 74,130 feet. This machine is displayed at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. There were a number of lifting body pilots, some names you'll recognize. NASA had eight lifting body pilots, X-15 pilot Bill Dana, Fred Hayes, uh, Apollo astronaut, Don Malik, John Mankey, 
Tom McMurtry, Milt Thompson, Bruce Peterson, and Einar Einavolson. The Air Force had seven active lifting body pilots, and I say that because Major Don Sorley and Colonel Chuck Yeager both checked out in the M2F1. But uh, Joe Engel, uh, X-15 pilot, Dick Scobie, uh, shuttle pilot, Jerry Gentry, James Wood, Cecil Powell, Peter Hogue, and Michael Love all were assigned to the lifting body program by the Air Force. Here we see some photos of some of the pilots, Milt Thompson, Don Malik, and Bruce Peterson. Captain Joe Engel and Fred Hayes. This is an interesting photo because both uh, Joe and Fred became Apollo astronauts. Joe was a backup to Apollo 14 and assigned to the very final flight, uh, Apollo 18, which was canceled. Fred Hayes uh, flew on Apollo 13. And then both uh, Joe and Fred flew the uh, space shuttle approach and landing tests of the space shuttle Enterprise. Here's John Mankey, who made the uh, precision landing on runway 22. Tom McMurtry, who also flew the shuttle uh, carrier aircraft, the 747 with Fitz Fulton. And Bill Dana, shown here on the lake bed, seeing the famed uh, mothership salute uh, as the uh, aircraft had landed on the, on the lake. But I mentioned in an X-15 video that uh, the flights of the lifting bodies were all of four minutes. And it took, in this case, uh, probably half hour for the B-52 to descend from altitude. And so uh, as a salute to the program, uh, the mothership pilots would always kind of buzz the lake bed in a salute, as you see here. The next step was the approach and landing tests of the shuttle. Uh, the shuttle program and the lifting body program overlap by about two years. And here we see the shuttle Enterprise on the shuttle carrier 747. And uh, those first flights were in 1977. Pre-flight four was the first time without the streamlined tail cone. In this painting, I'm showing the uh, uh, shuttle flown by uh, Joe Engel and Dick Truly at the moment of launch. Uh, the craft went from a launch altitude of 23,500 feet to the lake bed in two minutes, 15 seconds. Next step, space flight. Here we see the shuttle Discovery launching from the Kennedy Space Center. And the first orbital landing at Edwards was the shuttle Columbia in April of 1981. Now, if a picture's worth a thousand words, this is uh, quite a photo because it shows the 14 year time span from the uh, M2 F1 to the shuttle Enterprise. So here we see an unusual shape and this shape led to this shape. And there you have it, the story of the lifting bodies. As always, special thanks to the great folks who uh, made this presentation possible. And thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care.